war is often regrettable, but we say, Mr. Speaker, it's very often necessary. I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to tell you what cases we view war as legitimately. I'm going to tell you when it's actually reasonable for the war, and I'm going to talk about why there do exist cases where the costs of war are in fact worth it, and I'm going to talk about why necessarily their policy or well, their idea of how people should assess of whether they should sign up for the military or not necessarily creates a prisoner's dilemma in the United States. We think that's harmful, right? So let's talk about a few <coughs> points of rebuttal before I go on to that, right? Because the first thing he says is that by going to war, by going to war in a different nation, you're saying that my life is more important than theirs, than the people that I'm shooting, right? We think, Mr. Speaker, that's largely contingent on this notion, on the on the presumption that war is conducted on the defense of your own life, which we think is very often untrue. When you went to war in Germany in World War II, it is very often not that when the US went to war, it wasn't in defense, it wasn't the US defending itself, but it was in defense of the Jews who were being okay. massacred there. No, thank you. So we think that it's about recognizing that there are causes that are more important than your own life, right? So we think that's something that's fundamentally a good thing and fundamentally the moral thing to do. But he says, he says, secondly, wars can't be fought well because they're fundamentally about destroying your humanity. We asked Mr. Speaker, what's more, destroy, what, what's more likely to destroy your humanity? Fighting a war that you think is just or standing back and watching while the worst atrocities the world has ever seen are committed? We think it's the latter, Mr. Speaker. That's why we are willing to go to war when we know it's necessary. He says, okay, secondly, sir. he says that wars can't be fought well because there's a massive propensity for abuse in the terms of, this, uh, with, for, of soldiers, right? We think that, firstly, we think that the Geneva Conventions and the rules of war sir. have gone a long way in terms of preventing these things. But we say, secondly, we think that soldiers aren't a moral agent. We think that the international community already recognizes that when it comes to things like the fact that they recognize that we want to ban chemical weapons Sir. because they cannot discriminate between civilians and enemy combatants, but we can allow infantry on the ground because they can make that distinction and recognize that they do make that distinction, Mr. Speaker and members of this House. So we think that Sir. the wars when fought can in fact be fought well. The final thing we've talked about is people cannot be compelled to fight. We agree. We're not against a draft, Mr. Speaker. We think that people do, in fact, volunteer to fight and, in fact, are morally responsible for volunteering to fight when they believe that wars are just. When are wars just? We say, Mr. Speaker, that war, war when, like, going to war is legitimate because, firstly, the first criteria we propose to you is when all other means have been exhausted. Second, when there's a reasonable expectation of success when you go to war. Thirdly, when the assessment of the benefits of success outweighs the harms of going to war for every person involved, i.e. not just your own country, but even the country that or, or the entity that you're waging war with. This is the principle of proportionality. And fourthly, when the cost is legitimate as determined by your nation's democratic process. That's what, for instance, what we went to war, the US went to war, the US and the, and the UK, and the, most of Europe, the parts of Europe, went to war with Germany to stop the killing of Jews, right? And for, in particular, NATO uh, like, uh, intervened to prevent Sir. the massacre of ethnic Albanians in Kosovo, right? So we think, moreover, we think that war must be conducted in a just manner, i.e. proportionally, and with respect for the Geneva, Geneva Conventions and international law. Okay. And we think that in these cases, we think that it's your responsibility as a person to in fact sign up for this war, for this war as long as you recognize that these, this criteria have been met, right? Because we think that there do exist costs where the costs of war are worth it, i.e. things like preventing genocide or even stopping it when it has taken place. Sir, because we think that ultimately the costs of war are fine. We recognize that lots of people are probably going to die, right, if you go to war. But at the same time, if you don't go to war, lots of people are still going to die, right? And the atrocities simply aren't stopped. So not only do you incur the same costs as you go to war, but you, you incur the cost of the loss of your humanity as well, right? The law, because we think that what makes us human is our ability to empathize with other people, our ability to recognize our common humanity, 
and that our common humanity entails a responsibility to our fellow person when they are being uh, when they are being massacred by their governments unjustly. Well, we think that being massacred always is unjust, right? Sir. We think that means that you have the, the that it is your responsibility <laughs> to make sure that that doesn't happen. Fine. Our war is actually just, or they just we just told by states because they're inevitable that we should just accept it. Well, I mean, like you said, people are independent moral agents. And we think that people can in fact decide when a war is just or not based on the criteria that I just gave you. And the argument that I'm giving you is for not for people to blindly accept it when the state tells them to go to war. What, the, uh, what I'm telling you is when people recognize that the criteria that I provided are met, we think that it's their responsibility to go to war because we think that the costs are worth it. The second thing I'd like to talk about is why there's necessarily a prisoner's dilemma. Because we think that if everyone were pacifist, right, each state essentially has an incentive to deviate from that pacifism. Essentially that means, because it means that you can capture the benefits of the use of force without its costs. Because no one will use force in return against you because these other states are in fact pacifists. But here's an interesting question. Who is most likely to do this, to deviate from pacifism? We think that these are less morally scrupulous nations and governments like North Korea and Iran. But the problem is that when people, when people with democratic governments who are more or more conscientiously objecting to going to war, what happens is we are disenabled from engaging in war with these nations when they act in a manner that flouts international law and when they act in a manner that endangers human life on such an egregious scale that we the people that, that, that the person the people can recognize that we do in fact that it is in fact necessary to go to war. So we think that makes means that war that in this case going to war will be necessary and signing up for the military will in fact be necessary. What have I given you? I've given you our criteria for when in fact it's reasonable to war, it's legitimate to go to war. I've talked about how these factors that like, these uh, these criteria can be met. And I've told you why their policy creates a harmful environment in the national community. We're very proud to stand up.